that it could be 40 degrees at some time. So, you know, this is, doesn't really happen. So um, my research program, um, ever since I was an undergraduate, has really been focused on brain development. I've been fascinated, you know, there are about tens of billions of brain cells, more neurons in the brain than there are stars in the Milky Way and the galaxy. And how do they all connect together? How do these brain cells know where to go? And when they find their target, how do they connect? How do they recognize each other? And once they recognize each other, what allows them to develop synaptic connections and the connectivity between those brain cells? And what happens when these connections go haywire and, and they are disrupted either due to um, you know, neurotoxicity or environmental factors? And if that happens in the adult brain, how do you promote regeneration? So I have also been interested in addition to neurodevelopment in the area of, of neuroregeneration. And finally, uh, um, brain chip interfacing technology. So what I'm gonna do today is I will present some of the work from the lessons that we learned from brain development, you know, in the developing um, animals. And we will use both simple organisms, invertebrates, as well as vertebrate models because they really, uh, Mother Nature is very conservative. Mother Nature has used building blocks. So a neuron is a neuron is a neuron. A synapse is a synapse in a synapse from a worm to fruit flies, to snails, to human. So those building blocks are just like brick. You can put it, you can make a, you know, a large high rise building with it. You could build a mosque or a temple with it, or you could put it in your house. So a brick is a brick. So synapse is a synapse, neuron is a neuron. So the lessons that we learn from these simple organisms and model systems are really important. And because we need to go back to where mother nature, um, you know, use these technologies, different mechanisms to put this inc incredibly intricate brain uh, together. So I will I share with you today some work in progress and that is in the regeneration um, I, you know, arena that how we are using brain chip interfacing technologies also to um, promote regeneration and because in the peripheral nervous system regeneration does occur and we will use that as a model. And finally, I will talk about brain chip interfacing technologies as to how we can use those as that technology, not only to understand how brain functions, what are the connectivity patterns between the brain cells, what do they say to each other when two brain cells come together? And you know, you will uh, see that when these brain cells chitter chatter, uh, you begin to unravel the actual secret conversation that would be equivalent to a parent has got a chip or a hidden camera in the, in the, in the young kid when they go out for a party. So parents know everything. Or when you arrive at an airport, you will begin to see that um, you know, one uh, person who's getting off the air in the airplane will come and say, How are you? So from the language, you actually begin to decipher as to where this individual is coming from and what their connectivity could be. So, so we will go in these three different areas. But first part of my talk, I will really primarily focus on developing biomedical engineering um, approaches to be able to see if we could promote nerve regeneration in the spinal cord or from the peripheral neurons. And then the lastly, I will show you some of the evidence about how can we use um, brain machine interfacing technologies or semiconductor uh, silicon chip technologies to be able to A, record from large networks of brain cells and B, if we could actually regain some of the lost brain function by using these technologies. And of course, you cannot really study any of this in the intact brain. It's extremely complex. You know, imagine tens of billions of brain cells. In a baby's brain, there are actually twice the number of brain cells when the baby will end up after birth and after a few months into birth. <clears throat> so half of those brain cells are killed because of the program cell death. So you, the actual brain cells in a developing brain are twice in number. And each and every neuron has hundreds and thousands of branches and connections. And it's incredible that not a single one ends up making a mistake. This really is absolutely magic. And that's 
really keeps me, um, you know, um, awake at times. So when you look at a simple, uh, you know, what we have learned over the years, we know that the neurons are the building blocks. These neurons are connected through specialized structures called them synapses. Synapse is a means of communication between two brain cells. When they talk through, it's just like an embassy between Canada and United States, United States being presynaptic neuron, Canada being postsynaptic neuron, and these synapses are the, um, the embassies through which they communicate primarily. And of course, they are supported by glia. Glia are no longer support cells in the brain that provide the, the livelihood and, and put food on the table, but they're also a very important player in terms of you know, either myelinating the fibers to uh, prevent the leakage of current. They're also important as a tripartite and, you know, relationship between them and neuron is, is really critical. So these neurons, when they come together, they really establish neuronal circuits. And these neuronal circuits are highly dynamic and they undergo neuroplasticity. And this plasticity really allows us the ability to be able to, um, you know, um, um, basically adapt. The brain is an adaptive machine. It's not like a computer that you think about a hardwire Imagine for all our life, the hardware is never upgraded. Um, and you know, like you do in your computers, you buy a new, better computer, faster computer, and your semiconductor technologies come in. But in case of these neurons, a brain being a computer, but it is highly plastic. It changes every time we learn something or any other external influence that comes into it. And those plasticity um, then really give rise to behavior a different behavioral rep repertoire that really comprises the adaptability. So <clears throat> all of this is determined by, you know, in part by the genetic makeup, but most of it really is epigenetics. And epigenetic plays a pivotal role in terms of really defining the final patterns of connectivity between these brain cells. So, you know, in terms of monkey and a human brain, we're 98% um, of the connectivity in the brain cells and even the genes are identical. But because in a monkey, the brain develops so fast that almost 75% of the brain is developed at birth. Whereas in a human, it's only 25%. So this epigenetics will play a very important role, the environmental factors that would allow slow and gradual really upgrading of this software uh, um, as well as hardware. <clears throat> So here is a single brain cell sitting in a culture dish. Now this brain cell, imagine in your brain and it has a remarkable task. Now imagine in a giraffe, a brain cell may be around the you know, spinal cord. It has to go and innervate that toe, little toe muscle. And this neuron is almost you know, traveling across the Atlantic to be able to get to that place. And it has to navigate through this virgin territory and it uses a number of cues. And those cues are really, first of all, the substrate on which it is growing must be conducive to growth. <clears throat> and then this brain cell will really get the cues from the environment, often diffused molecules, which could be trophic molecules that are released by target or the adjacent tissue like a road whereby it is actually paved road. And so these neurons, um, developmentally are guided by galvanotropic mechanisms, meaning that the applied electric field from the adjacent tissue allows them to go in a particular direction. And then the, the chemotropic mechanisms whereby chemical molecules are often released from the target at a distance. And these growth cones, which are at the leading edge of each and every neuri are, are really so smart that they can sense the environment and they grow in this direction. Now, in this particular case, you can see this is in seconds and minutes. Um, you will see that the brain cell is growing all over the place because we gave it the trophic molecules that were present in the dish. So there was no selective gradient of trophic molecules coming from any given particular place. The other thing is that you could see that not only the trophic growth is everywhere, but also it doesn't have substrate adhesion molecules. We have coated this dish all along. So the entire dish is coated with laminin and fibronectin or you know, polyalysine, the artificial 
charged substrates. So as a result, this brain grows everywhere, but this is not what happens in the intact brain. Brain cells don't grow in this fashion. Otherwise they will end up really spending so much time. The brain will be mismatched, cross innervation, and often you would turn out to be complete zombies. So a couple of things to remember that neurons are guided by applied electric field. The elect, even in an after spinal cord injury or nerve injury, you could detect actually electric current in the vicinity of the damage to nerve fibers. So we know that the tissue that is adjacent to the injured nerve generates applied electric field, which can be measured. So we know that this applied electric field is acting as a galvanotropic mechanism whereby the growth cone is recognizing that applied electric field. And if you do the experiments where you bring in a cathode and, and, and you know, electrodes and anode, you will see the growth cone actually turn towards the positive molecules and turns away from negative molecules. So uh, the charges um, and then the trophic molecules that are released um, you know, in a specific patterned way. Um, if, even in a spinal cord, you'll see there are gradients, a chemical gradients that allow these brain cells to go from low concentration to high concentration. And this is how these growth cones navigate. So if you look at a single growth cones, and we have done a lot of interesting work whereby we can even cut a growth cone. And when you cut a growth cone, even a growth cone um, or a neurite that is cut from its cell body has the autonomous ability to be able to recognize both environmental cues. Absolutely amazing. You thought the brain was amazing and your neurons were amazing. Actually, these growth cones are absolutely amazing. Even if you cut it from the cell body, it still has the autonomous ability to be able to recognize its environmental cues, not only environmental cues, but also targets. So we know the molecular components of these growth cones, the red one is all actin molecules, and then green is microtubules. And you can see the philopodia, which is really the antenna, which senses the environment all over the place are comprised of actin molecules. And when a particular philopodia moves forward, um, either it's pulled or it's pushed, the microtubule enter into that philopodia and once it actually enters into philopodia, that becomes the leading edge of that growth cone and it will turn. So the growth cone itself is really the, the brain within the brain cells that is endowed with incredible capabilities of um, navigating through virgin territory in the brain. And it does this autonomously because there is no way for a growth cone that is located far distance to be constantly in communication with the cell body if you think that the neurons cell body is actually the major factor that um, you know that uh, makes all the decisions so these growth cones will navigate through virgin territory they go all over the place so even if you use a culture model um, these growth cones will grow in all directions and i think the important thing to remember here is that when you think about nerve injury or a transaction when the nerve is injured we do, do know that as compared to the brain, the, you know, the central nervous system, um, particularly the brain where you know, natural replacement of damaged brain tissue doesn't take place, regeneration doesn't occur you know, for the, uh, most vertebrate brains. And whereas the peripheral nervous system, um, peripheral nerves are capable of regeneration, they can regenerate. But what happens often is that this regeneration is often incomplete and it is always almost accompanied by neuropathic pain because what happens and now imagine that you are watching a hockey game or a you know, Super Bowl and if everybody were to leave at the same time, the traffic jam will occur. Nobody will go anywhere. So often happens is when a nerve is injured, all of these axons will, will turn on the speed to grow, but when they are all growing, they get mishmashed. They often get cross innervated, and, and this cross innervation leads to neuropathic pain and also incomplete uh, regeneration. Now imagine that if you were to put traffic lights 
And those traffic lights guide these neurons in a very systematic and an orderly fashion. You could actually get much better regeneration and also avoid neuropathic pain. So <clears throat> we know that the peripheral nerve injuries are often debilitating. And in most instances, they result in permanent loss of function. The peripheral nerves, as I said, they can regrow after uh, injury, but the regeneration is often incomplete or it's mismatched or, or it is accompanied by neuropathic pain. So to achieve functional uh, regeneration, and this is what I was talking about work in progress, it is really important that we develop and design strategies that can facilitate functional regeneration. And, and then not only functional regeneration, but also to speed up the entire process. And we have published actually a paper in Jet Neuroscience uh, a couple of years ago, whereby we act showed that this, you know, we could four to five times, we could enhance uh, nerve regeneration and often using these metacarpal tunnel syndrome, you know, the surgery, even the surgeons will, um, you know, do their job or if the nerve is resected somehow, we could actually enhance the growth by planting our uh, portable devices. And I'll, I'll show you in a bit. <clears throat> but the other important thing is that when you're using a culture model whereby you're growing these neurons on flat substrates, and, and um, as we were talking earlier, that these neurons, when they grow on an artificial um, 2D substrate, which is plain polylysine dishes or you know, laminin coated dishes, the neurons get stuck to the, the dish or the substrate so tightly that if you introduced a glia or the Schwann cells, these Schwann cells, for them to be able to myelinate a myelinating fiber, it has to get underneath. But what happens is that because the neurite is so tightly attached, these Schwann cells, they just hang around. They cannot get underneath to be able to wrap it and make it a myelinated fiber. And that is really a major problem for studying MS-related diseases or peripheral nerve injury because these Schwann cells do not have access to axon because axon is so tightly stuck. And if these Schwann cells, once they get underneath, it, it just like someone gets under your skin, all of a sudden these axons get lifted up and they detach from the substrate and then they pull back into. So what we wanted to do was to actually create a substrate, which is 3D. So the 3D substrates, meaning that brain cells are actually grown in a, you know, in a substrate, which is more like a jelly or a pudding. Um, and we created Gelma, which is a, you know, interesting uh, um, biocompatible substrate. And that allowed us to be able to grow these cells in three dimensional. So brain cells were no longer attached to substrate. So what happens now is that you introduce, uh, you know, Schwann cells, and you could see that the process of myelination actually begins. And these um, axons begin to get myelinated. And it's really fascinating to watch. I don't have time to actually show you the videos whereby, you know, a Schwann cells, they will, they will um, you know, fight with, they will interact with each other freely. But once a particular Schwann cell has made a contact and um, with a nerve and it starts to, to um, wrap around it, and you can see the wrapping around as well. As it starts to wrap around it, the, really the exciting thing is that it becomes repulsive to all other Schwann cells that will now contact it. So it seems like it acquires an identity and it says, hey, hey this is my spot, you go somewhere else. I am, I am uh, engaged here and this one, this part of the axon is taken. And so we can actually watch them in the series and systematically are myelinating and we're using myelin associated proteins and others, we can actually show that these um, axons get myelinated um, as, as we deem appropriate. So from a chemical engineering where you can actually design these environmental um, you know, uh, substrate in the 3D that allows you to be able to study myelination, which has really been a major problem in the field because we know that um, there is really no cure for um, you know, MS related diseases. We also know, um, we do not understand how axon get myelinated 
either with oligodendrocytes in the brain or Schwann cells at the peripheral nerve line. But when you see these neurons, even in culture, the growth is really haphazard, it's random. And even if you grow them in 3D substrate, they still have the ability to roam around in, in the jungle. They just go around even in a 3D or a 2D substrate. So we needed to straighten them out. How could we really send a beacon to them and then guide them in a particular direction in an orderly fashion? So we developed um, you know, these, um, these chips and these chips are interesting. In these grooves, we put down the electrodes which are capable of, uh, they are basically transistors um, coupled with capacitors. So some of these uh, holes will have transistors, the other capacitors. And what we do is these electrodes can create an applied electric field whereby we allow these axons to act, for example, just like a tuning fork. The other thing we do is we take nanoparticles, we will dip these nanoparticles, we charge them with, with you know, negative or positive charges. The core shell of the nanoparticle is charged. And then using the capacitive current, um, we will hold them to a particular capacitor. To give you an example, if the nano bead was charged positively, we will pass negative current through our capacitor, which is located here, to hold these nanoparticles or nanobeads. Now, these nanobeads are also coated with trophic molecules, for example, a BDNF, NGF, CNTF. Depending upon the cell type that we are using, we will coat them and we will hold them, we cage them. And then what happens is that when we want to release them, we change the polarity of the charge. So now the capacitor will, instead of having a you know, negative charge, it will create a positive charge. So if the bead is negatively charged, it will be repelled immediately. It moves away from that and it diffuses along these grooves and, and the growth cone or a neuron coming from the other direction will sense that cue and see the chemical gradient and it will grow in that particular direction. So we put the traffic lights on these. So turn left, turn right, and we determine these neurons as to where they're going to go. They're not allowed to go in all over the substrate, but their growth is really targeted and directed and time controlled, as well as um, you know, um, electrically controlled. So we can create networks of those same cells that you saw earlier. They were growing all over the place, but now we can find them and we restrict their growth to a particular um, you know, direction and particular pattern that we define. So all these neurons that you see here <clears throat> are not growing all over the place, but they are, I mean, there are maybe a few that kind of try to get off the track, but for the most part, they will really grow only in one particular direction, the way they would normally grow in the intact brain. <clears throat> The growth is really not haphazard. And then what we can also do is we can mostly naturalize this process. We can take a particular neuron and, and we identify two of its targets. These targets always release um, you know, trophic molecules because brain cells um, sense these chemical gradients and they grow in that direction. We introduce these two targets later, uh, 12 hours later after plating the first cell <clears throat> and when they release this chemical gradient, so the trophic molecules, it's like a scent, it's like a smell, it's just like a, a syrup that is being sipping out of these. And then these, you can see that the growth cones can actually recognize and they grow in that particular direction. And what happens is that you can now create networks of these brain cells that you could define their patterns of growth and in, in a very highly orderly um, fashion. So the idea really is, um, you know, moving on to um, how can we really now take it into a sort of a clinical setting. So I'm going to show you, <clears throat> we are working with Integra Life Science right now to come up with these neurotubes. And these neurotubes are meant to promote growth in a highly ordered and in a directional manner and by using both chemotropic mechanism as well as um, uh, using um, a applied electric field. So what happens is when you grow these cells, for example, um, in, in our culture dishes, 
what we do is that we could create, you know, that the growth cones are the one that we need to target because they are the navigator, they are the Columbus of the brain cell. And what we do is that we create a series of electrodes, which is in a tube configuration. These growth cones uh, can sense these, um, you know, um, applied electric field. When we stimulate this particular one single growth cone, will grow in the area that we are either uncaging these trophic molecules. And you can see that they're being picked up um, by the growth cone and it grows in, in that direction. We can stop and start. Now imagine that you do a tube um, whereby you have a series of these capacitors and transistors. You can, when a growth cone makes a contact with first series, it shuts off, it turns on the next series of electrodes. And these growth cones will now grow in a very orderly and highly, so you can see this trophic molecules, these nanoparticles are being picked up by the growth cone. So the idea is that if we could allow these brain cells to grow in an orderly fashion, imagine a tube whereby brain cells are now growing along the lumen of the tube first. And once they grow, the other axons will adhere to them and then they, they grow along, along those axons. So you put the traffic lights, you make the growth highly ordered, and you also prevent any clumping of these processes, and you promote nerve regeneration, which is faster and much quicker recovery, um, and there is no neuropathic pain. So we actually have a patent for this, a couple of patents, and we are working with Integra Life Sciences to be able to come up with tubes that could be implanted after spinal cord, after nerve injury, whereby we will be able to guide these axons in a highly ordered manner. And you can see that as it grows along the lumen, each and every electrode has a capacitor. So you think about it has a capacitive charge. So when growth cone makes a contact with this series of electrodes, it changes the resistance of the electrode. And that electrode is then switched off, but in a series, it will activate the next uh, series of electrodes and when these electrodes are activated, they will create an applied electric field or uncage trophic molecules. So you do systematically whereby the growth cone, it's a fully automated process. You don't have to do anything. These electrodes are smart. They will detect when the growth cone makes a contact and the moment it makes a contact with that particular, the actual capacitor resistance is altered. It turns itself off but then it turns the next one in the series on. Now imagine this thing turn into a tube and this tube could really be placed between uh, as a nerve graft between the peripheral target or another nerve and then you bridge the gap between them. So, so this is really a work in progress, but I think that if this approach becomes really fruitful and in a clinical setting, it will also offer a tremendous opportunity for spinal cord injuries and, and also, um, you know, many other aspects of it. So, um, so this is really the first part I showed you is really focused on nerve uh, regeneration and how the semiconductor chips or these, you know, this nerve conduit, um, a chip conduit or an electronics conduit can play an important role in tackling, uh, you know, this problem of uh, incomplete mismatch innervation and also the neuropathic pain after injuries. So this is work in progress. And the final part of my talk is really focused on brain machine interfacing and how can we really use this approach uh, to now understand how brain functions and what happens if a brain is damaged. We know the brain is a biological, you know, um, of course, when you look at a stroke patient or somebody who had meningitis, you know, the kids who died of any other injuries, this lump of tissue that sits in front of you, it's primarily biological. We know it has neurons as I showed you, it has glia, it has all the other things and different parts of the brain do different kinds of things. But this is not what really creates our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs. That is mostly electrical and it is not observable or measurable by just looking at the tissue itself in its own cell. So how does you know brain function? It's really important um, and, um, uh, and of course, tens of billions of brain cells, you know, I started with 12 neurons and I thought that I walked in water only to realize that I was the dumbest person on planet and um, recording concurrently from 12 cells. Now people are recording up to 
uh, making contact up to several thousand, 4,000 neurons, and even larger neurons could be recorded from. And so the idea is to really, um, if we are to understand how brain functions, we must acquire the ability to record from large networks of neuron. And that has been one of the holy grail of neuroscience, the grand challenge to be able to record at a single cell level. The other grand challenge in neuroscience is, I think this is where the, the paradigm shift needs to come, is that the damaged brain tissue cannot be repaired. Stem cells are not going to work. They turn into tumors. And even if you produce those neurons, the guidance molecules, the, the ones that pave the road are no longer there. And as a result, you cannot get these neurons to grow from one place to another place because all those molecules that paved the way um, have really gone away. So can we then now use um, you know, these um, um, brain chip interfacing conduit to be able to regain lost brain function if we were to create a hybrid whereby a brain cells can talk to a semiconductor chip or a chip could talk to brain cells. And we know that the brain seeks purpose through interconnectedness and brain cells, if they don't talk, the cells that fire together, they wire together. If they don't fire together, they will not wire together. If they you know, kind of fire apart, they fall apart. Um, so we know that the electrical activity really plays very important role. And if that electrical activity is no longer there, the brain cells really um, lose purpose in life and then they commit suicide. And that happens with chronic depression and many other, um, other things. So um, we don't really have the means to repair brain wiring once it has gone haywire. And um, we try to do something really very, very important. So they ask the question, if communication is really important, for example, if you have a kitty cat, <clears throat> early stages of development, you put a patch over one of its eye, and a few days later, you remove that patch, the kitty cat is blind in that eye for life. So the sensory input is really important for visual um, tactile pathway development. And in its absence, brain cells just do not connect. <clears throat> and this deficit then remains with us for life. Children who cannot hear, they cannot speak. So I think, you know, this interconnectedness and communication is really important. So we need to understand how they communicate with each other. <clears throat> so we know the synaptic transmission, the conventional way we could record from brain cells is either using, you know, sharp electrodes, we could use patch electrodes and we can you know, understand what it is that forms the neuronal excitability basis of brain connectivity. When you fire action potentials in one cell, you can record one for one excited postsynaptic potential in its connected cell. You fire a burst, you get a compound response. <clears throat> and then when you fire a single action potential, you see <clears throat> that the actual amplitude of this EPSP is much larger now than it was before the burst. So this short-term plasticity, because it returns back to short-term plasticity, is also really important that we need to keep in mind that brain cells are not hardwired. They undergo dramatic plasticity. This plasticity forms the basis for all learning memory and adaptability by our brain. So not only <clears throat> we have to be cognizant of the electrical parameters, the ion channels, the neurotransmitters, the receptors. But we also need to know that this is not a hardwire system. <clears throat> it actually undergoes a synaptic plasticity and it changes all the time. So this change is also really important, but it also is a treasure for us because we could alter, it's not a fixed action pattern. So what we do is in our lab is that we can actually grow these brain cells on, on a chip we could record their activity patterns and um, for days and weeks and to be able to really do a true brain chip and a brain computer interfacing, um, we needed to make sure that A, we develop a biocompatible substrate, we develop electrical uh, components that are sensitive enough to be able to record from individual brain cells. And then, um, then to be able to not only have one way talk, like you would see for epilepsy patients where you're only recording um, you know, the discharges and the, you cannot interfere uh, using those same components. Or in a Parkinsonian patients, you insert these deep brain stimulation electrodes where you stimulate those neurons um, in the substantia nigra and then get the dopamine cells activated, but there's not much you could really do. 
um, in terms of getting a feedback from those cells. So that would be the situation here. When you see that stimulator can stimulate a neuron and deep brain stimulation, neuron is screaming and yelling, stop, stop, nobody listens to it. The other way I talked about is in epilepsy, when the neurons are firing, the transistor picks up the activity, but there's not much it could do. So what we wanted to do was to, instead of using a direct electrode to stimulate that you use in DBS, to use a capacitor that could stimulate neurons the way they are activated naturally. And when it fires, it will activate its partner and underneath is a transistor that picks up a signal. So you complete the loop whereby an electronic device can talk to brain cells and they can talk back. So in instances where you lost the connection between these two brain cells, you can bypass this by using electronics to, for example, stroke had destroyed this part and then these brain cells were disconnected from sensory to motor or motor to, to other areas. And now you can bypass using this technology. This I still think is a neuronal dynamics and digital computation is still a bit way off. So the way it really um, works is that you have in our original prototype chip was that each and every electrode had to be connected with this male female component and we could create a capacitive charge underneath the brain cells it depolarizes as if another brain cell has activated it or an impulse has arrived. So if you use the same capacitive current, the brain cell fires, the impulse travels along the axon, it activates the connected postsynaptic neuron. And when that postsynaptic neuron fires, you have a transistor, you pick up the activity of that cell. So you complete a loop whereby an electronic device can talk to brain and then the brain can talk back to that electronic device. And of course, you know, these brain cells grow beautifully on the chip. They don't mind at all. There is no repulsion, there is no rejection. And that was a critical really chemical engineering component because without this, it wouldn't have really worked. We also had to keep the brain cells alive. So we created, developed an incubator that has CO2, PCO2, temperature, humidity, control, everything is controlled <clears throat> and it is cell phone and remote controlled. We can monitor cells, record and maintain everything while sitting at home. And when you grow these large networks of brain cells, you can actually monitor the activities from days to weeks to months. And that was prerequisite to understanding how brain cells you know, connect with each other, how they, once they're connected, what is their um, activity pattern? <clears throat> how do they develop networks? And can we record the network activity? But still they're cultured neurons. We wanted to go to intact brain slice. <clears throat> and I really didn't think that I would live long enough. So you have capacitors here. Capacitors will stimulate, this is toxin. Let me play it back and slow it down. <clears throat> so what you're going to see is a hippocampus slice whereby um, where you have CA3 and CA1 area. So this is the presynaptic area that needed to be stimulated. This is where the input comes in. Um, and when these neurons are activated using capacitors, they will activate postsynaptic neurons, which are located in CA1 area. So uh, you then put transistors in this area and you have capacitor in the stimulation area where presynaptic neurons are, and you can actually record and monitor the activity of the entire circuit and um, alive. So when you have toxins where you only activate presynaptic cell and there is no activity that projects to postsynaptic cells because you have blocked using TTX, the actual in, uh, you know, uh, electrical impulse traveling to the postsynaptic site where it can activate postsynaptic cell, the activity will die down right here. Or you can use NMDA receptor blockers or you could use really the, the, or the receptors on the postsynaptic site. Without the toxin, what you're going to see here is when, it, and it is all in, in real time. So when you stimulate these neurons here, you will see that the entire slice lights up. And here we go. <clears throat> so with toxin, the activity really dies off. It doesn't go anywhere, but without toxin, you could see the presynaptic neurons are activated they will activate postsynaptic neuron, and then you record from the entire slice real time um, using a, this hybrid of capacitors and transistors um, from an intact slice, <clears throat> brain slice. 
And so when we take the freshly isolated, even with our 3D electrodes, we design these electrodes so they actually penetrate into the slice um, and they could record activity at the single cell level. And you could see the actual spread of activity. And this is the induced seizures using, you know, from, um, uh, either applying potassium or using a knockout mouse model which spontaneously seizes. So the idea is that you can actually record this activity in an intact slice because that's really important um, because these are naturally assembled circuits, unlike the cultured paradigm where they are unnatural. We don't know if two brain cells will ever be connected with each other and in the fashion that they connect in culture because when you take parts of the brain, there are millions of cells, you dissociate them, they just randomly connect um, and they may not be connected though that way in the intact brain. And here you have really an intact slice and you can record the activity from large networks of neurons. But there still is a problem. And the problem is <clears throat> we are only recording from neurons that are juxtaposed or are in contact with the chip. Brain is three dimensional. So what about those neurons that are sitting in different levels? So we grow these uh, brain cells in silicon wafer and this silicon wafer um, we also label these neurons with fluorescent dyes. It could be either a voltage sensitive dye or it could either be a calcium indicator dye like Fura2 and others. And when we fire a laser through the microscope, laser changes the properties of this wafer. And then when the properties change, it will activate that particular neuron. And once that neuron is activated as a presynaptic stimulation, it will activate the entire network that it is connected to. So what happens in that case is the following. You fire a single laser, you can see the entire network really lights up. And you're now recording from up to 100,000 or even up to millions of neurons that are not just in immediate contact with the chip, but they're thinking in the entire slice. So the idea really is that can we now take this technology into a clinical setting whereby we could now have the ability to monitor directly stimulate brain cells and then monitor the activities of large networks of brain cells um, you know, indirectly. So you can imagine that if in animal model, if we were to um, you know, um, plant a chip in the sensory motor cortex, when the animal makes a contact, for instance, um, with the food palates, the visual cortex will talk to the sensory motor cortex and it would have to reach out normally to grab that particular palate. Now imagine a chip that is implanted in the sensory motor cortex, which acts as a remote control. And because you will design these prosthetic limbs yourself, you could pair them just like we pair our remote control with our TV and other devices to be able to, to really have these brain control um, devices. So the important thing really is that um, as this technology mature, it had really tremendous potential not only for understanding the brain circuits of the brain cell functioning, but also to be able to really use a true a neuroprosthetic device that could be controlled um, by using this approach. So <clears throat> we, um, in the last couple of my few slides, we wanted to really take this now research from benched in the bed area, and we targeted first the seizure detection. As you know that, you know, especially I was the director of Children's Hospital, when kids don't respond to any medication, they are, are you know, um, they, they need to go through a surgery to remove that part of the brain where these seizures are coming from. But when um, these surface electrodes or depth electrodes are mounted, um, the resolution is really very low. Um, and the other thing is that these kids need to be attached to a 30 foot cable. They stay in the hospital and the device is also uh, really quite uh, cumbersome. So we thought that we could use our chip, which is 300 times more sensitive than conventional surface electrodes. And we also wanted to make it completely wireless so we could send the kid home. And then we also wanted to make sure that the chip that we plant in these electrodes are MR compatible. So once these electrodes are mounted in the scalp, we could take an MRI image <clears throat> now we know the juxtaposition of these electrodes exactly in, in, in relation to different parts of the brain that we are trying to um, really determine or detect 
the seizures that are coming from. So biomedical engineering and our you know, neuroscience teams, we get together. These are conventional electrodes that are used um, you know, to monitor. You can see that these wires are attached and then the kid will be attached to a 30 foot cable. They stay in the hospital and there's a lot of cost associated with it. And also lots of other um, related tension and stress for the poor kid um, all throughout the time. So we wanted to do was to develop a chip that could be implanted in the brain um, and then make it MR compatible and make it completely wireless. So these little sensors would then send any particular, every time the child really seizes, it sends a signal to a portable device that is either in the pocket on, or in the backpack. And it will not only provide the exact location of where the seizures are coming from, <clears throat> but also the incidence as to where, how many times or how often, <clears throat> excuse me, these seizures are occurring. Put it back together. And then what we have been able to actually do is to detect these seizures with exquisite accuracy. And then the detection is almost 50 to, um, to 20 times higher than the commercially electric, um, available electrode. So um, we are being really approved to go through now the process of really testing it in the clinical setting is about to begin. So I think in the interest of time, I'll stop here.